Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me know you're here. For some reason, uh, the Zoom window is telling me there's no one in the chat, uh, in the uh, webinar, but obviously that's not correct. So I'm Christy Keith. Uh, we're just starting now. I see people asking. I am a senior communication strategist for Fear Free, and I'm very happy to welcome you here this evening to our puppy socialization webinar, um, running a puppy socialization program in your practice. Uh, we are extremely grateful to Siva for making this webinar possible, and to my dog Stella, who is uh, also obviously extremely excited to be here tonight. Hopefully she will be <laughs> quiet in a moment. Um, and I'd also like to just take a few minutes to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions during um, Ms. Lee's presentation, please uh, go ahead and put them in either the Q&A window or the chat window. I'll be monitoring both. And uh, we will get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, and don't hoard them up until the end. Please enter them as soon as they come into your mind. If by chance she answers them uh, in the course of her presentation, that's fine. I'll just skip the, over those. And yes, this presentation will be available um, on, as a recording if you have to leave early or if you want to share it with someone. It usually goes up within a week, but with the holiday, I would say it'll probably be more toward the middle of next week. So uh, speaking of which, again, thank you all for being here. I know for our uh, Canadian attendees, this is a big holiday for you. Happy Canada Day. For those of you uh, in the United States, happy upcoming 4th of July. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Rachel Lee's RVT, KPA, CTP, and VTS behavior. We're so, we're so happy to have you here with us tonight. Ms. Lees is a graduate of Cuyahoga Community College, and she is the lead veterinary behavior technician at the Behavior Clinic, where she enjoys working with her patients to help them achieve medical care. One of her longtime special interest areas is puppy and kitten development. She is a Fear Free certified professional and approved speaker for Fear Free. And in addition to serving on the Wellness Committee for NAFTA, the Academy of Veterinary Behavior Technicians Council of Regions, and as the speaker chair for the Clinical Animal Behavior Conference, she can be found in a yoga studio or spending time with her pets. So uh, Ms. Lees, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very, very excited to be here today. Puppy socialization is a blast and it's how I truly got started into veterinary behavior. So I love presenting about this topic. So thank you guys for having me and thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate you taking time on this Monday evening before uh, the holiday this week. So Awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So again, the lecture is the puppy, so puppy socialization, running a puppy socialization program in your practice. Okay. So jumping in, our goals of running a puppy socialization class are as follows. So we want to expose a young domestic animal, such as a puppy, to a variety of different people, animals and situations to minimize fear, aggression, and promote friendliness. Our goal is truly to start these puppies off on the right paw and set our clients up for success, truly in working towards increasing and keeping that human animal bond intact. We also want to give them as much positive exposure to different types of objects, sounds, and substrates. Again, create, and we wanna create positive experiences that will last a lifetime. So whether you have a puppy that comes in with a young couple, we wanna make sure that we can expose them to as many small children or other animals or things of that nature as possible as we never know where these people are gonna end up and where this dog is going to be in its life and what new surprises might pop up. Also looking at it as, Again, I wanna make sure even if I have an older client that comes in, do they have grandkids? 
do I need to socialization, socialize this dog to different medical pieces of equipment and all of those different things? Because I truly want to set this dog up for success for long term with these current owners. So benefits of a puppy socialization class and of doing puppy socialization in general. This creates, as I mentioned previously, a strong human animal bond with owners and their pets. This creates a more cooperative patient at the veterinary hospital, which I'm sure most of us can agree is as technicians, assistants, or veterinarians would be immensely helpful, right? <laughs> Uh, it can also increase revenue when ran inside of the practice as the instructor of the course might be selling different products like thunder shirts, clickers, treats, etc., as well as offering some different services. They can offer things such as happy visits, puppy visits, working towards small pieces of behavior therapy, which again can always increase some revenue. Positive and bonding experiences for pet and clients within the clinic. When I ran these classes in my general practice before I worked at the behavior clinic, I loved it because A, I, I was a long-term person within my practice, but these dogs grew up with me. And it was super fun to be able to watch them grow up and to be able to watch them have good experiences. And then those owners were immensely bonded to myself to the clinic and to all the doctors and staff. So again, it kept that puppy and that parent at our practice for the long haul, which is what we're looking for. So this is kind of where I think most of us are at today. If you're here, typically we go, my clinic's inter interested in doing this, but where do I start? Therefore, I kind of think, well, we have to kind of brainstorm and come up with some different ideas and figure out where we're going to run this. What are the days of the week that we're going to offer it? Do we do different theme nights? And what is my class style? So diving into some of these, again, where will we offer classes? So typically our setup, we want to use a more climate controlled area that has an easier way to be able to clean up and sanitize the location. We'll typically say an indoor location is more preferred because it's much easier to clean and sanitize for things like parvo and any intestinal diseases and such things of that nature. We also want to make it escape proof. We want to make sure we don't have any puppies running free, especially when we do off-leash play interaction. So that's one thing we want to make sure we're watching for. I also really enjoy the ability to be able to divide a space. So I know one place that we're currently using and renting space from within our practice as the behavior clinic has grown over the years and no longer have this big fantastic area that we used to have in our front lobby. Uh, we are able to have the ability to block off different areas and gate off different spaces. Therefore, if I have a puppy who's a little bit more concerned or might be more abnormal, in its interactions or is more fight fearful or frightened, I can separate them and give them the appropriate therapy, which I'll be going through momentarily. So that kind of gives you hopefully some ideas on where to offer. Again, when I worked in general practice, we used our daycare space. We also had the ability, now that I'm thinking back on it, to use our front lobby. If I ran classes at eight o'clock at night, Nobody was there at that point because we were not a 24 hour practice and it would have been actually fantastic because it also is going to make awesome things happen within the veterinary hospital and even in the lobby. I always like to make sure I wrote stations for objects that you have some places and you have areas where you can set up a lot of your objects that you're going to be socializing or getting your puppy acclimated to. So again, just some other things to think about. What days of the week would you use? I typically want you guys to remember never to be shy to ask your clientele what they're looking for. Send out a survey. Survey Monkey, I believe is free, <laughs> but that's one thing where you can go on, set up an entire survey and send that out to each of your clients and even ask if you were interested in doing a puppy class, 
what times of day would be best for you? What days of the week? And that way you can kind of know and get a little bit of a consensus on what they're looking for as well. I personally was a fan of theme nights. You can see in my picture, I'll be honest, this was a Halloween party. So you can tell some of the puppies are dressed up. Uh, so with that being said, <laughs> uh, you can also do different theme nights where within my flow or how I would do this, I would have some nights where it would be family fun night where I would have and create a theme of which we're going to have more interaction with kids, strollers, children's toys, etc. cetera. Uh, another night might have more information with out and about. So I might do sounds with cars and motorcycles and traffic, as well as have some traffic cones and I try to bribe some of my owners to dress up as construction workers, uh, but do some of those different things. So that way puppies would get more and more comfortable with some of those different objects and stimuli. But again, have it in a theme way. So then that way it kind of made each week fun. Now different class styles. You can use any, a lot of, there are tons of different styles you can use. I am a huge fan of the rotational style as you can enroll puppies at any time. If you were present for Dr. Feltis and Amanda's previous lectures, we know that the socialization period is between six to 16 weeks of age. So with that being said, within that age range, we want to try to get as many puppies as we can, and we don't want them to wait. Using a rotational style allows you to be able to get puppies in each week. The puppies that may have been in the previous class may have an opportunity to interact with a bunch of other new puppies and or continue to meet new people, new children, new objects as the weeks go on because you never know what's going to walk into your puppy class. So at least we want to, but not in a surprising way. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> a conventional style could be more of a four week course where again, it's more where like, okay, so we have it Tuesday for four weeks. You enroll, a pup, you enroll new puppies every four weeks, which again, could still work. The one challenge I do find with that one is again, these puppies by the end are all gonna be buddies, which is awesome, but you're not getting them out to meet a lot of new different types of puppies within that age group. And you're also, they're gonna get used to the people within the class, which again, can be really helpful for these abnormal guys, but also for the more normal ones, I wanna get them out and I wanna have as much different exposure as I can. But I will tell you, using a more conventional style is going to do and be really helpful and easier to manage in the long run. Some people, and I know our clinic right now, we do puppy parties twice a month. So what that is is where we're, it's not something that they come in every week, but they're, we're doing a, a puppy party twice a month. And it's, I like to say it's supplemental. So it's something that if I have another client who is enrolled in a puppy class at a, at a local trainer, I will say, hey, come to our puppy socials. There's a ton of fun. You get to have an opportunity to have your puppy interact with dogs within the same age group. And again, it's supplemental. It's not gonna hurt anything. And if anything, it's gonna be more helpful for some of those other classes you're going to be taking your puppy to. So as I have mentioned before, don't be afraid to survey your clients. See what's going to work best for them. So who is going to be the class leader? So when I look at that, I typically am thinking you're going to be using most of the time your clinic employees. So this could be anybody from a veterinarian to a credential technician to a veterinary assistant. Again, this can be really awesome as it can be an additional source of income. And also I wrote stress relief because truly this was a big stress relief in my days. When I would run puppy class, it was a, it was a long day. I will tell you that as I worked a 12 hour shift prior, but once I, I was excited, I was like, Oh great. I can't wait to see puppies. Who doesn't want to play with puppies all day? <laughs> I know I absolutely wanted to, especially from working in a general practice that had multiple doctors. Unfortunately, we'd have to do a lot of euthanasias and, it talk about a lot of stressful things, whether it came to internal medicine, you know, abnormal diagnoses or medical conditions, 
it was wonderful to be able to end my day and to have fun playing with puppies at the end. It really, truly was awesome. So it's a great way to relieve some stress and give you a positive, positive ending to your day. Different communication skills. So I, you really, truly want to have a good variety and ability to communicate with people in that may have different types of personalities, different age groups, to things of that nature. I have listed on my slide here, uh, don't nag tag and using tag teach. Tag teach is truly an amazing way to be able to interact with your clients and actually tell them what it is that you want. I could talk about tag teach for hours as it's something I'm very passionate about. And I think Teresa McKeon is a genius and she's amazing. Uh, Teresa is the founder of Tag Teach International. And she's also speaking at Clinical Animal Behavior Conference. So just to throw that in there, I'm really excited to have her. But it kind of goes through the importance of, again, giving your clients specific points. Okay, if you want them to reinforce at a specific location, you're going to be able to give that information quickly and kind of not go around in circles 25 times. Tell them exactly what it is that you want. We want to make them successful as well. Also, a wonderful resource for communication skills as well is using uh, the canine and feline behavior for veterinary technicians and nurses by Debbie Martin and Julie Shaw. They have a fantastic chapter on communication that I think is also equally amazing, discusses some of the points with Tag Teach, but again, has a great way of going through different types of communication styles and things of that nature. So again, also, you wanna make sure that your puppy leader is going to be knowledgeable with learning theory, canine body language, puppy growth and development. Puppies are learning all of the time. <laughs> So you want to make sure that your puppy leader is able to understand what they're potentially reinforcing and what that owner might be potentially reinforcing. You want to be able to troubleshoot. You want that person to be able to answer these, some of these questions that these puppy owners might come in with and give them correct scientific information as that's really, truly important. Body language is, again, equally as important, especially if you're going to have off-leash play. And you want to be able to describe to these owners what they're seeing that's normal with their puppies' interaction with other dogs and what might not be so normal. Obviously, puppy growth and development, we want to know what's normal at that age range, what's abnormal. So within your class structure, I wrote create your own flow. I'm very, I try to be more laid back and fun, <laughs> but I wrote my ideal class flow as, but I also want you guys, I guess, to remember that you can create your own class flow, whatever works with you. So again, I typically will start off my courses with having an introduction where I typically will introduce myself, give a brief history, and I will give a little information about my own animal because I wanna, as much as I wanna be that leader of that class, I want these people to feel comfortable enough to be able to ask me questions and for them to be able to open up to me. But then I am also at that point going to turn the tables on them and ask them to go around the room and introduce themselves and their puppy because I also want them to be comfortable with, I guess their peers, but as much as this is, socialization for puppies. Again, puppies don't walk in by themselves. They come in with sometimes one person or two people, not more. And I want these all it almost to be a small support group, if anything. <laughs> I want everybody to be comfortable enough to ask questions. If, you know, your puppy is biting you and or else your puppy is constantly crying in the crate, I want you would have been able to answer, ask me that question in front of everybody because somebody might be not comfortable enough to ask it out loud. So again, I wanna make sure everybody is as comfortable as I can possibly make them within the class. I will then go through an introduction to positive reinforcement training. Again, with this, I am not gonna go into a huge amount of detail with using 
clicker training and things of that nature. I will talk about it as I am a huge advocate of using the clicker or marker training in general, but I am just going through it typically on how to use it for socialization purposes. I would be doing more of a obedience, reinforcement of appropriate behavior things in a more structured four week course that's going to be strictly on teaching foundation behaviors. I will then typically go typically go into play groups. So I typically do some off leash play for about five to 10 minutes, let my puppies interact. I will also during that time be running through body language, trying to show them what's normal, what's abnormal. If I'm seeing a more abnormal piece of body language, what should we do about it? Again, I'm gonna jump into all that more momentarily. I usually will then try to give everybody a potty break as I try to set everybody up for success. Because uh, also you have a lot of owners that if their puppy does make the mistake of eliminating in the room, they get mortified. And again, I, even as many times you can say that they're puppies and it is okay, you still see them blush and be super embarrassed. So try to set them up for success. Once everybody comes back in, I usually start to do some exploration and exposure time. Then I typically end with trying to work on either giving the puppy something amazing to work on while I'm able to kind of run through and do question and answer with the owners or else I'll have the owner start to reinforce more quiet, calm behavior. So again, any way that you decided to do that is, is wonderful. Just again, make the flow as comfortable as you can for yourself. Okay, so jumping in a little bit more to positive reinforcement and using socialization or utilizing socialization. So I have here the definition for positive reinforcement which is adding a stimulus the animal wants after or during a behavior they are performing. So again, our goal when we use marker or clicker training is that we are re giving that sound or that conditioned reinforcer the moment the behavior is happening. I think of the clicker as a bridge, truly like think of a draw bit bridge and it's bridging the communication gap. So without using the clicker, Animals can learn, they truly can. The clicker, in my opinion, makes things crystal clear. And that is our way to be able to communicate and say, that's it, that's the behavior I'm looking for. That's the behavior I want. Therefore, you're using the click, so every time that the dog hears the click, they learn something fantastic follows. So if, say for example, I have a puppy who is fearful of a pizza box. It happens, right? <laughs> but say a puppy is concerned about a pizza box. And every time that puppy go, goes up or looks or interacts with that pizza box, I can click. And if I were to toss a treat away or give that puppy a treat, and treats in the click only happen when it interacts with that pizza box, the puppy is gonna to start to feel really comfortable about that pizza, scary pizza box. So again, a different way to think about it, but your goal is to truly reinforce the behavior as it's happening and make that communication crystal clear. You also wanna pair highly valuable food with these experiences, sounds, substrates, etc. Previously, I know Amanda and Dr. Feltis have also talked about using Smart food is what we call it within our clinic. And that's typically where you're using a treat that's small enough that it's typically the size of a pencil eraser. Guys, this does not need to be a huge treat. The big milk bones, no way. Your, your puppy will become a coffee table. Literally, I'm thinking a small, like the little zooks I know are what we use. Cut those up into quarters. They do not need to be anything huge. So again, it's just something that needs to be small. If you are going to use something lickable, three seconds and it's gone. So I also will call it a three banana party. So one banana, two banana, three, take the food item away. You want it to be measurable. So what is the pet eating? What is the pet not eating? When is the pet eating? You want the treat to be utterly amazing. 
So again, and that's all going to depend on what that animal finds reinforcing. So I always joke and I always say, for example, I'm a person, I find junk food or chocolate or anything completely and utterly amazing where I also find things like celery. Ugh, not for me. I mean, I'll eat it or carrots. I'll eat it. I'm just as much of a Labrador retriever as anybody, but I am not going to work for carrots. No, I'd have to work for like cookies and milk. Like that's would be my reinforcer. So again, it has to be amazing for that specific individual. You want to keep a record and or document some of these things. So next week at puppy class, you can find out if you were to bring out a, the same object, say a puppy was really concerned about the stethoscope and you were to bring it back out, you use a higher value food item, you have that documentation of what they ate last time. And then again, that food item should be temporary. You are only using it for specific interactions during a short period of time. So again, it's not gonna just be out willy-nilly giving treats the entire class. You're gonna be reinforcing very specific behavior and very specific interactions. So our techniques for puppy socialization. Truly, this is the bulk of my lecture. So I'm gonna be going through different ways on how you guys can implement some of these strategies into your puppy classes. But also one thing that I truly, I'm a, I'm a visual learner and I like to watch people do things and then I pick up my own techniques. So I really would have loved to have a lecture like this when I was starting classes as it tells me a little bit what I should do and what things should look like where also, okay, if things aren't quite normal, what should I do? So my goal is I want you guys to feel comfortable on when to give reinforcement, when you should be clicking, where you should be placing your treats, so on and so forth. So jumping into this, you're always going to be observing behavior. So again, your goal is that these puppies are going to be offering, we all offer behavior. So again, they're going to offer very specific behaviors that we're going to observe. Then we're going to mark the wanted behavior. Um, with the positive exposure to that stimulus or that item. And then we're gonna give our puppy a treat. Again, our goal that we want to remember is to prevent flooding or any negative interactions. So a lot of clients, even when I, work in, when I worked in general practice or even in my current position, I will have clients that come in with their dog that's two years old and they said, well, I tried to get my puppy out and I did a large amount of socialization but I find out that they just dragged their, not drag, but they were pulling their dog along the street, making their dogs meet other people, and their dog was terrified the entire time. They never matched up the interactions with anything positive. They just took their dog out and thought that that was socialization. We, again, want to try to match and pair as many positive, positive things up as possible using food or using a very specific reinforcer that that puppy enjoys. So when does reinforcement occur? You should be using the marker, the marker signal the moment the interaction with the stimulus occurs. So I have a video down here that's going to demonstrate that as well. Where do we place our treats? So this is one that always throws everybody for a tizzy. I typically say you're going to place your treats away from the stimulus or away from that object. And my reasoning is, is it gives your puppy a chance to kind of decompress and then they get the opportunity to reset and reinteract with that stimulus again. So you're going to see me working with Archie below and you're going to see that I'm giving treats away from the wheelchair. Because again, when he looks away and he has to grab that treat, it gives him another opportunity to turn back around and reinteract with that wheelchair. Again, puppies on leash or off leash. In a group setting, please keep puppies on leash. Um, having them off leash does give them the point of, okay, I do have free will, I can move myself away. But also if they are on leash, they still have that ability. If you're in a group class, keep everybody safe. Um, also having puppies just running free all over everything gets to be really messy and not fun. <laughs> so keep everybody safe. 
All right, so here is a video on using timing entry placement for these techniques. Isn't he adorable? Cutest lab. And I will tell you all these videos. Oops. Oh, good. This is my slide. I need to talk about it anyways. So my disclaimer is I want you guys to understand I did these videos in a different type of format. I wanted to be able to present you and show you what normal interactions look like, what abnormal interactions look like, and give you guys specific therapy and, and show you guys some of that information on where you would be clicking, where you would be treating, how you would be interacting and coaching potentially. With that, this is not, I do not have a group setting in these situations. So just know that. Know that these were set up I have not met these people before. I literally met them the day that I shot video, as well as their puppies. So you'll hear me talking about things a little bit more and explaining things as I go through. But I want you guys to understand that it looks very different and I do have puppies off leash and I do have some of this stuff a little set up differently than I would in a group class. But again, I wanna just give you guys good video to show you. So please don't hate me. <laughs> okay. So here's my first video of a normal interaction to a substrate. So this is Miss Ruby Sue. Uh, I called her Ruby Sue, her name's Ruby. But she is super adorable um, and she's interacting with a new substrate, um, which is a yoga man. So again, I'm reinforcing the moment she steps onto that substrate. <laughs> so you will see that I vary my treat placement here as well. There are times I'm tossing treats onto the substrate and sometimes I'm tossing the treat off, depending on what the puppy's body language is showing me. And then I'm get, again, when I toss the treat off, I'm giving the puppy the chance to kind of reset and go back over to interact with it out of her own free will. So again, a good example of how to do that. Some, oops, ah, okay, sorry. So. Um, our next video I have is a normal interaction to an unfamiliar object. So I am from Ohio and in the summertime, obviously we're not using shovel, we're not seeing shovels. I certainly hope we're not. In Ohio, it's been a little rough here with rain recently. Moving on. And also we have really long winters, but I hope to God nobody ever sees a shovel in the summer. Uh, but my goal is this is actually your time where if you do have a puppy in the summer, you want to get them out and expose them to winter objects or different winter coats, um, snow, snow blowers, sounds like snow plows and all those different things as well. So again, I have her interacting with the shovel and I also do some coaching in this video as well. So, this is the stuff that a lot of people forget about. So, it's summer right now, right? Yeah. So, you're not going to have to work around sled boots and shovel them and all these different types of winter objects. So, if you have a snow blower, if you have some of these different things, you might want to bring them out. That's a really good one. Again, you can see she's a little concerned, but again, I'm not going to make her go near it. I'm just kind of making it around. And I'm 
And I will say I'm pausing it real quick to let you guys know that, again, that is a more normal interaction. She does get a little bit more fearful, but she has that quick recovery. That's what you're looking for when you have a puppy within the socialization period and within that window. So again, I love the fact that she was quick to recover and she continued to work with me the entire time, which is awesome. All right, so here we are switching. Um, I have the owner in and I'm doing a little bit more coaching with the owner. Oh, story of my life. Sorry, guys. There we go. So we're clicking for looks at the shovel moving and changing positioning. So you start to see she kind of moves away. She does a little displace, displacement snipping and stands up and moves around a little bit more. So I didn't pick up the shovel again. And I kept my criteria lower to set her up to be successful. <laughs> I had the cutest puppies for these videos. I get so excited watching them. Okay, so here is Mr. Jack and he is, I'm working on Again, it is the week of the 4th of July here in the USA. So again, I want to pair as many positive interactions as I can with some different sounds. There is an app, which I will, I think I talk about it in a later slide, but in case I forget, it is called Soundproof Puppy. Seriously, super amazing. It's like $3.99 and has some of the best sounds I've heard in a very long time. And as long as you have a, like a Bluetooth speaker, the sound quality was awesome. So I have nothing good, but not positive things to say about that. So here is Mr. Jack and myself giving just positive things happening during fireworks. And you can see I'm very intently watching him as things get louder, but he's doing fantastic and he did awesome. So again, he truly did great. He ate the entire time, which is all things we're looking for. So those of you who were in the previous lectures may have seen some of these videos. I'm not going to keep them on for a super long period of time, um, but just kind of goes through some socialization like this is to a vacuum um, from having, you know, I here I am bringing in a vacuum cleaner and this is Kato and Kato's much more nervous. You can see him backing away, increasing his distance and I'm just having it even sit in the space. So for this video, Amanda, who is our senior technician and one of my mentors was just asking me to just go ahead and just give food. So I'm not using a clicker here, but again, just shows that again, I'm trying to give food to him whenever he looks right at the vacuum. <laughs> yes, good, there you go. And then I toss treats away. So again, I'm not forcing him to go up to it where this is rainy and she's a huge ham sandwich, but she could care less. She's like, oh, vacuum. <laughs> and she's a lovely border collie, so she's, you know, smarter than me. So again, just some video to show you what that looks like. Then lastly, I wanted to give you guys, again, this is another video from Amanda and Dr. Feltz's previous lectures, but it truly is a great video. This was a two puppies that I had in puppy class. Rainy is also included in this video. Um, 
but this kind of talks and shows you some actual normal puppy play, which I'll go through what some of that looks like. But you want to be seeing things like loose, wiggly body language and <laughs> positive interactions where there's a lot of that mouthing. But again, you're seeing role reversal. They can stop and take breaks. We have nice wide tail wags. The shepherd will stop and let Rainy take time to chase her, and then they'll do the opposite, which is, again, gorgeous, wonderful, fairly appropriate play. And then this is also Alice and another puppy um, interacting as well. So again, you see that nice wide tail wag with both puppies. You do see that the one puppy is slightly pile erect, so you see some of that hair slightly raised. And then you go in here, this is Moose and Rainy. This is when Rainy was much smaller. But again, you see that nice wide wag, some of those little play bows, which is again, all good body language that we like to see when there's playing. And again, you can even see a little roll reversal where Rainy might lay on her back and then let Moose interact as well. So again, I, I wanted to at least just show you some of that and then again, go into kind of what I call like the puppy's language. So when you're doing this, A, you should, in running these courses, you should feel comfortable, again, talking about body language but also feel comfortable in educating clients how to read their pet. If I could see hands raised, I would ask everybody, how many of you wish puppies came with an instruction manual? Number one. Number two, with a dictionary or I find a, a language, something that they can learn to understand. Things in a scientific fashion. <laughs> I know I do. Um, because puppies don't come with manuals and there unfortunately is a lot of information that they can find on different websites that are not scientifically based or different books or things on television. So again, you guys need to be the advocate for these puppies and make sure that they are um, getting the right information. When I read body language, I'm typically looking for six different pieces of body language and I will focus on those six different body parts. I will also talk to the owners about reading the entire puppy. I can count it. If I got a dollar, or not even a dollar, let's say a quarter for every single time somebody said, my puppy was doing great, he was wagging its tail and then, you know, he bit me or he went after the other dog. Tail wags are not it, guys. It is the entire dog. And I think I'm preaching to the choir on this one. So again, I want you guys to be focusing and it's showing them that there's six different pieces of body language to observe. We typically want to be looking at the tail. I agree, it's important. But for some breeds like pugs or English bulldogs or Frenchies, they don't have much of a tail. So there's not really going to be much that you're going to be able to see. So that's where looking at those other parts are important. And again, when I'm looking at tail posture, I'm looking, is it wide, wiggly, kind of horizontal with the spine? Is it elevated and vertical with a tight amplitude where it's slowly moving back and forth? Or is it completely tucked underneath their stomach and completely still? Then I typically look at their posture. Am I seeing that loose kind of, I think of golden retrievers because they get so excited and they wiggle their entire bodies. It's like the wiggle worm, you know, and am I seeing that or am I seeing more of a stressed dog in general that might have a more stiff posture. Its back is very rigid, their muscles are tense, and they're not moving very much. Is the hair pile erect or do we see it raised along that ridge line? What are their ears showing us? Are they forwards? Are they back? Are they more neutral? What do their eyes show you? Are there, do I see the whites of their eyes? Do I notice pu their pupils are dilated? Are the brows furrowed? Kind of what exactly are you seeing? And then again, the mouth. Are we panting? Are we lip licking? Are they growling? What, again, are we seeing with each of those pieces? 
So then once I have all that information, I'm gonna make my assessment on whether or not the dog is comfortable or not. Um, and again, I there are some interactive games you can play. I have like a little Easter egg game where I, I will have everybody draw a body part out. And as the puppies are playing, we talk about each piece of body language. So that's one thing I know I do. And again, I always like to make sure I mention the fact that Adaptal can be immensely helpful for these guys, especially when interacting with puppies, even in their own age groups. And using Adaptal has been clinically proven to show and benefits of using it within this period and in puppy classes, even for normal individuals. So you see, I love Newfies. So just so you guys know that you'll see a lot of Newfie pictures in here because um, one of the veterinarians I used to work for is a Newfie breeder. So I love my Newfies. So supporting these lemons or more abnormal puppies um, that we come in and we see. So again, if I can, if they're in the group setting and say I notice that I'm seeing a puppy that showing some more abnormal body language than I'd like to see, or they're having a more abnormal interaction with another puppy or an object or a person, I will do my best in the group setting to try to give them a small amount and it's not special attention. And most people will understand and they're very supportive. They'll say, please do what you need to do to help that guy feel better. But Really, that's one where after class, I might ask them to stay and I might work with them more one on one on those specific issues that we're seeing. Again, and then it depends on what we're seeing. So with unfamiliar people and with all of these things, we're really going to be using a lot of desensitization and classical counter conditioning in these situations to help change the way that they feel and use, you know, things like distance and you know, look, decreasing volume and things of that nature to make the stimuli less scary. But again, I wrote here, you want them to be able to have a choice. Again, I want them to be able to not be forced to interact with puppies. If they are more fearful and more scared, I want to try to do my best to give them hiding spots. Um, I want to be, if I notice them being more fearful, I'm going to do what I can to maybe put up a baby gate and use a barrier to keep them separated. The play pens can be truly very, very helpful in, in giving them an opportunity to do that. And in the previous video with the shepherd and uh, Rainy, the border collie, you may have noticed that I, there was a puppy behind the gate. And it, it, that was the space I love so much because I was able to help coach those owners to, hey, their puppy was really worried about seeing the dogs running around and playing. But instead of having that dog sit in the middle of the play group and barking and growling and being really uncomfortable, I was able to be, give that dog some space and give the owners some therapy on what they could do to help set their puppy up for success. So again, some actual behavior therapy, which like I said before, you're going to be using desensitization, which is again, the way I think about it is you're presenting that stimulus at a lesser intensity. And then classical counter conditioning is changing the way the animal feels about a potential stimulus. So whether it's a sound, substrate, dog, person, object, whatever it may be. I will also talk about consultations, which again, I know Amanda and Dr. Feltis mentioned and talked about this a lot in the last lectures in this series. But um, again, if needed, if I'm noticing that that puppy is very abnormal, or if I'm noticing some pretty severe pieces of body language, I might discuss a puppy jumpstart, or I, which is an, an, an appointment with Dr. Feltis. That's a, an assessment of, okay, you become a patient. Let's get you guys on the right track. Let's see what we can do to help. Um, and again, our goal is not to scare the owners. You want to come at this as a way of saying, you know, no, oh, your puppy's abnormal. Absolutely not. You know, your puppy seems much more concerned about this than the average dog. You know, and what we want to do is we want to make sure that your puppy is going to be as comfortable as they can, as we want to make sure that your dog is going to be set up for its life in a more positive manner instead of it being fearful and concerned about certain things. Most people are very understanding and they are very open to the potentials for doing those different types of things as well if you are able to talk about it and explain it in a, in a more positive way. 
Pheromones and supplements, I, I again mentioned this previously, but again, the Adaptal Junior Collars are, I, again, a newer um, marketing technique from SIVA, but they're perfect because they fit these little guys and they're marketed just for our puppy clients. Um, so again, there was a positive study during the socialization period that showed improvements with normal individuals as well as abnormal individuals. So again, sending these guys home when they come in for their puppy appointments or their first, if they come in for puppy class, even if you included a, a pheromone collar as part of the purchase, when they come in, um, that might be something that you can build in. And then that way, when they come in, they might have that collar on for 48 hours before they come into the class and it might help give all the puppies a little bit more steps in the right direction. So again, you can also use the collars, the sprays and the diffusers, which again, I, we always have the diffusers going within our practice. So it's very, very helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna, so here's my first video of a more fearful puppy. So this is Jack interacting with Archie. Again, I'm going to let you guys know, I didn't create make a boo-boo, but I didn't show you guys that he did, Jack did have a place to hide. Um, when you're doing puppy on puppy interaction, always offer them some hidey holes and some places to go. So they have a, a space to have safe sanctuary and to take a break if needed. The place was off camera and you'll see Jack sometimes does run away and he'll run underneath the couch. But um, again, you'll see this is a little bit of a longer video, but I'm gonna try to let it run as long as possible so then that way you guys can get the full view of what we're looking at here. And Jack's the black puppy, and Archie is the goofy lab that doesn't know his own space. All left. You can see here I have Archie on leash to try to make it a little bit more controlled. <laughs> Where I have Archie on leash, so if he decides to get up and run after Jack, I can stop him in the kindest fashion possible. And they were both hands. But you will see me trying to click and treat Jack for any positive interaction that he has with Archie. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to care and using things up with their interactions whenever I can. You can see in my, my wording, I am not perfect. So I, there were a few times when I was watching this video that I was like, oh darn it, I missed a few. So that's some of that more specific therapy. And again, in this structure, I was able to do this. In a group class, this is gonna be much more challenging. So again, in a group class setting, I typically do my best to have a little gated off space where I'm going to have the puppy and the owners in that area. And I'm again, going to be clicking and treating the puppy, the more abnormal or concerned puppy for looking at the other puppies, either playing, lying down, or just hanging out. So this is another one that I want to show you is a fearful puppy with a moving object. So this is, I think, Ruby. And she is, again, really worried about the child's Fisher Price, either little tykes. It's not even a fancy car like the kids have now. 
I'm pretty jealous that I didn't grow up in this era. Um, moving on. So this is, you can see some of Ruby's interactions where she's a little bit more stiff, her tail's more tucked. So looking at her body language, she's a little bit stiff, she's a little bit more <laughs> Victoria has fantastic timing. She was a really good client, picked up on things beautifully. So again, we stand up, we kind of back up a little bit. And this is again how I would work through this therapy. So when I do this on purpose, where I try to, cause lots of people will go, well, just come here. And you can see Ruby runs completely around it and does anything she can to avoid the interaction to try to get to me. So again, that's where truly using shaping can be very, very helpful with this because luring doesn't always work. So again, I have where I'm keeping that chair, that car very still. Now in the next upcoming mi minutes here, you see me start to move it a little bit more. I give her a little break and then we restart because she did start to come up to the car and nose target it was much more comfortable. But again, still with that movement, she's still backing away and still a little bit more concerned. And Victoria has aim like myself where I, I tried to strategically have her put it near the car, but um, it rolls right underneath. Again, that's the story of my life. So, um, but again, after this video, I told her, I was like, okay, so this would be something that if you have neighbors that have any of these types of cars or they have kids, maybe take her out in the front yard and you're going to sit on your porch and you're just going to click and treat while the kids go by on the sidewalk. Um, but we just start to create positive associations with that at a distance where Ruby's comfortable. Now this is, and I love this video because um, my best friend and her kids came in to help me with this. So Madden is the five-year-old girl and Cameron is the two-year-old who is refusing to interact with anybody. Um, so again, you know kids. But um, so this is a puppy showing a little bit more concern with interacting with kids. This is a longer video, so I may kind of skip and run through it for time purposes. But I love the beginning because you can see how good Ajax looks with Maddie. <laughs> he starts off very loose and relaxed and I'm clicking every time Maddie has a good interaction and touches and Ajax is really loose and relaxed. <laughs> So you can see Madden starts to do this fantastic thing that little kids do. So then I have Maddie even go ahead and give him a treat. So again, we see Ajax looks pretty loose, fairly neutral. When she does these crazy hand movements like five-year-olds do without thinking. So every time Ajax looks, I'm clicking and giving treats. So again, as much as Maddie listens to instructions, she 
is five and doesn't get to not run or she doesn't understand those things. So again, this is something with kids that is important to remember. Yeah, and the more Cameron and Jessica in the background, that's the mom, um, Cam starts to move around a little bit more and whine. I didn't notice this until I watched the video, but Ajax becomes much more worried about that too. Every time that she weight shifts with Cam in her arms and all that stuff as well. And you can even see that Ajax went off food. And Maddie again doesn't get it because she's just like, get the treat. And you see her get really loose and And again, I kind of push Ajax here by giving it to Maddie for him to give. But again, his posture still looks okay, but there's Jessica and Cam moving around a little bit and there he is increasing his distance a little more. So I should have been clicking and treating that. I know I missed it. So again, why videotaping is helpful. So in this video, you'll see me also increase my value of food. So I use peanut butter instead because he went off food. And I'm leaving it there a little longer to make sure that he's interested because he was a little hesitant at first. Now you can see he starts to eat those treats again. So, and I'm sorry, I enjoy talking obviously, but she, I know she had questions and, you know, they think E.I.T. Rach's job is really cool. So they wanted to learn, she wanted to know a little bit more about what I was doing. So, all right. So that kind of runs through a lot of the video portion. So again, and I'm going to be winding down here. I know that I'm running a little bit over. I apologize. Um, but again, so pet parent resources, again, we have the um, social butterfly checklist at thebehaviorclinic.com. So please feel free to take that. Another thing I love and that all these clients got was I printed out a fancy version of the social puppy bingo from Fear Free, which is awesome. And you can have different incentives to get people to bring it in. So maybe you give away a free book or you um, give them a coupon for free treats or something like that. But they get something cool when they go through and they do a lot of the puppy socialization checklist that you give. Um, this is something that's newer by Dr. Jason Nicholas. He has a fantastic uh, dog behavior and training essentials book that's fairly low cost for your clinic. And it's again, something that you can add in with your puppy kits or again, can be a prize for puppy socialization and stuff. And it truly has a large amount of fantastic information. Like there was stuff in here that I really loved um, and there was really not a lot of stuff that I was concerned about. So I really enjoyed it. Um, again, the ABSEB puppy position statement, which is important on why, again, it is important to socialize and to work forward, move forward with that. The Adaptal Junior Collars, which again, I have talked about, I know, in a, a great amount of length. And then resources for your puppy educators in the clinic. So again, truly, I have Debbie Martin, I, she's, I consider her a mentor. I'm, I'm happy to be able to say she's a colleague now. I've always looked up to her and she was my KPA instructor. But I will tell you her program, Puppy Start Right, um, by her and Dr. Ken Martin, is fantastic. Uh, the Puppy Start Right book was my, I call it my puppy Bible. I have the old spiral bound <laughs> version. So that is a fantastic resource, not only for a, a veterinary or a trainer, it is also fantastic for um, owners. But the Puppy Start Right for Instructors course is amazing. Um, it's through Karen Pryor Academy and I would highly, highly recommend it as she's going to give you guys the best tools to move forward and and run through on how to make you a fantastic uh, puppy instructor for especially puppy socialization classes. I currently have a uh, 
program through veterinary uh, or vet med team. So you're welcome to look that up. There's lots of different stuff I go through in that as well. There is Decoding the Dog. That is the book by the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. So again, highly, highly recommend that book to your clients as well as your puppy educators. And again, the canine and feline behavior textbook is amazing. Um, again, can't say enough good things about that book as well. So, so to kind of wrap up again, this is my A, I love the Browns and we're hoping for a good season with Baker Mayfield. Woohoo! But um, Yogi was my parents' dog and he was the reason I became so passionate about veterinary behavior. So I always like to end puppy lectures with a picture of Yogi because he's the reason I'm here. So if you have questions, you are always welcome to email um, the behavior clinic or else I did include my email here as well. Thank you. I hope so you guys enjoyed. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. That was fantastic. We're, we're going to answer just a few of the questions. Okay. Ask. Um, I know that, uh, you know, we did run over, but uh, let's see how many. We um, I'm getting some uh, feedback there, Rachel. Oh, hold on. I just got closer. Is it still okay? Um, no, it's really bad. Oh, I don't know. Nothing changed. I didn't do anything else. Okay. I don't well, know. We'll hope it's not too annoying to people in the audience. Um, so the first question, we're going back kind of to the beginning here, uh, asking about the rotational style of class. Um, it's kind of a multi-part question. Do you repeat the same lessons every week? How long are the classes? And just a little bit more detail on how you do the class. So, let's see. So, with each the with the rotational. Yes. Okay. So, with the rotational class, what I typically do is that is where I am going to. Typically, I have them pay for everything up front, so they might pay for a four-week class. Some people will do even like little cards, like a, like you can do like a punch card, so in that way you can come four times and you, that's all included. Um, but again, I, let me see, hold on. I, I made the mistake of opening up the question and answer thing, so now I'm looking at it. <laughs> So I'm trying to answer. Um, so again, I how I'm and I'm not repeating the same lessons. I guess I make it in that rotational fashion where like I'm going to do a theme each week. So say for instance, you come in and one week is veterinary visits, and that's your theme. Well, then the person that started on veterinary visit theme, there that's going to be their start date. But then the next week you might have out and about night. You might have family fun night after, and then you might have um scary sounds and things where you might be doing more of substrates and all those things but you might have four different rotational courses and then each time you're kind of running through different objects so then that way when you're doing that rotation there's a different theme for each week and then you can even have your little punch card stating like okay you came to family fun night these are the next two you or the next three you have to do or that you should do to complete your course Great. And then, you know, close the window. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm moving. I'm um, we had a question about how you do payments for a rotating class or monthly parties. And the context that she gives is um, they do a conventional puppy class, but she's been thinking of doing a rotational style, but they have space limitation. So how would you manage that in terms of payment and uh, limited space? I mean, I would kind of do it first come first serve. And again, what we do is we typically do payment, I, I guess we've done it both ways, where I would have people that would just come the day of. Again, it was harder because say I had a slower week and I was expecting some puppies to come and then they didn't show up. Like I wanted to know who was gonna be there because I didn't want one puppy to just be there. You know, I wanted to make sure I had enough, I, I had a good amount of puppies that were present. So, I would do, I would recommend to do signups prior to class, even if it's okay, you have to sign up at least 24 hours prior to the class starting. Um, and again, depending on what you're, I, you can have a max. I mean, I agree. I think it's appropriate, especially if you're going to do this by yourself. 
I wouldn't have more than six dogs because you're not going to be able to observe body language as well as you'd like to. So again, that's where also you're, as much as you're going to be doing prepayment, sometimes people don't always come to every class. Uh, but I always say to try, even if you did it to where maybe each class is, you know, I know our socials right now, I think are 15 a social. Um, so again, when they come in or they come in prior and they can just come in each week um, if, and sign up whenever we have it. They just call ahead of time the week of and say, hey, I'm interested in puppy class. We send information, they have it. Um, but then again, at the beginning of each class, I'm kind of running through each of those pieces of information, briefly discussing the clicker and giving them that feedback. But again, you can pay for it. If it was, you can just pay $15 a class. If you have them buy it in bulk, maybe they get a 10% discount. And then that way they pay for it up front and you use the punch card method. And what do you do in terms of breaking up by age? group by age how do you break those up so again because typically your puppy socialization if you're doing a true socialization course you should be doing it as the puppy is six to 16 weeks of age if the puppy is older than that i would be doing more of a that again the window doesn't slam shut but that's where you're going to be doing more of like i know right now um one of our technicians marianne is going to be doing a puppy prep academy where she's going to do a lot of obedience and foundation behaviors but i know she's planning on implementing some stuff with socialization so again as long as puppies are all within the age group i think that that's appropriate um and again you just want to watch your sizes i mean if you have a saint bernard 10 week old puppy that's 25 pounds and a little maltese that could be a problem but um truly as long as they're within the same age group you should be okay you will start to notice more changes in regards to interaction as the puppies get further outside of the socialization period so that's where i wouldn't recommend to have like a 20 week old puppy interacting with a eight week old puppy that 20 week old puppy is going to do more correction based behavior than and the eight week old puppy is just trying to learn what's appropriate and what's not um, and then we just have one more question, which is going to be fairly quick, which is, did you use a clicker in the first couple of videos? Yes, yes, I was. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Rachel, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you again to everybody who joined us tonight. And also thank you very much to Siva for making this webinar, in fact, this whole webinar series possible. The first two webinars in the series are already on our website at fearfreepets.com slash webinars. And this one will be up uh, probably by the middle of next week. Um, we want to wish everybody a very happy Canada Day and a happy 4th of July. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much.